This video is brought to you by Dragon City. Hey Wisecrack, Jared here. And today we're talking about the smart and stylish JRPG that lets you simultaneously date your high school teacher, your middle school age stepsister, and an alcoholic Lois Lane, Persona 5. For those of you who have never played Persona 5, we recommend pausing this video and playing through the 120 hour campaign. But if you don't have that much time, we'll summarize it for you. The Persona series is basically what you'd get if a group of otaku made a Pokemon clone set in the world of Inside Out. You spend half the game in a high school social management simulator, and the other half is a superhero gentleman thief that enters people's cognitions in order to catch them all. Albeit instead of Pikachus, you're nabbing mythological monsters, gods, heroes, historical figures, and characters from literature, including whatever the hell this is. Going by the codename Joker, you slowly assemble a crew called the Phantom Thieves of Hearts to heist the innermost desires from the most powerful and corrupt adults in society. You sons of bitches! What's the job? So let's look at whether the aspects of Persona, which people praise so often, are actually deep or dumb. Spoilers ahead for the original game, but not for the expanded version Persona 5 Royal, which won't be stateside until the end of March. Before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to Dragon City, a mobile RPG available on iOS and Android. Dragon City is like a hero collector, but instead of heroes, you collect dragons, generate gold to buy food, and level up your dragons for battle. There are hundreds of very cute and very ferocious dragons hidden in Dragon City for you to collect. I recently found the Binge Dragon, my personal favorite, the Movie Fanatic Dragon, and a Serial Killer Dragon. There's even a Poo Dragon. You can also breed different species to complete your collection. I bred my binge dragon with my movie fanatic dragon and they had a neon dragon. Collect as many dragons as you can and use them in battle, but more on that later. You can download the game for free using the link in the description. And now back to the show. Part one, Jungian psychology. Carl Jung was the founder of analytical psychology. Just as his colleague Sigmund Freud invented an entire vocabulary for psychoanalysis, Jung coined terms like archetype, shadow, persona, and the collective unconscious, and the series cites its Jungian influences explicitly. In Persona 4 Golden, you can unlock new episodes of Mr. Itagawa's TV Classroom, which are straight up lectures about Jungian psychology. But the primary place you encounter these Jungian terms is during the combat sections. When our regular high schoolers enter the metaverse, they transform into personas that are dramatizations of the Jungian concept, much in the same way as joy and anger in Inside Out are dramatizations of emotions. Really, the whole world of Persona is a dramatization of Jung's ideas about the human psyche. Take the Metaverse, a world created by human cognition that the Phantom Thieves are capable of entering. The Metaverse is representative of all psychological activity, collective and individual, conscious and unconscious. Some parts, called palaces, represent an individual's mental activity, specifically their distorted perspective of a place in the real world. Take the girls' volleyball coach Kamashita. He's got such a high opinion of his status at Shujin Academy that he envisions it as a castle ruled by him as its king. Other parts, such as mementos, are how society as a whole sees the world around it. And given the deep cynicism of the day, it's not a pleasant place. This shared psychic space of society, along with the sea of souls from which all shadows and personas emerge, are dramatizations of a Jungian concept called the collective unconscious. It's those parts of the mind that we inherited from our most remote ancestors, like fight or flight. But it also includes what Jung described as pre-existent forms, the archetypes which give definite form to certain and psychic contents. Of the innumerable archetypes within the collective unconscious, Jung considered four to be primordial, the most basic and universal images, among which are the persona and the shadow. Personas are social masks that the ego chooses to wear. Jung himself described them as designed on the one hand to make a definite impression upon others, and on the other to conceal the true nature of the individual. In Latin, persona refers to the masks worn by actors, and in the game, whenever they enter the metaverse, the phantom thieves quite literally wear their personas as masks. Per Jung, the thieves' personas are how they want society to see them and how they want to see themselves. Take On, who is apprehensive about her beauty because it draws unwanted attention. When her persona awakens, it's as Carmen from the famous opera, a fierce femme fatale who uses her penchant for seduction to deadly effect. Effectively, this transforms On's appearance from a liability into a strength. Another Jungian term is shadow, or the psychological aspects which the conscious self is unaware of and would rather not acknowledge. In the game, shadows serve as the enemies. Most are generic, but the bosses are shadows specific to certain characters. But the game designers didn't just look to Jung for their world building, his ideas are equally represented in the gameplay mechanics as well. 
The way shadows and personas are grouped reflects Jung's concept of archetypes. Per Jung, the term archetype is often misunderstood as meaning certain definite mythological images or motifs, but the archetype is a tendency to form such representations of a motif, representations that can vary a great deal in detail without losing their basic pattern. So the personas aren't themselves part of the collective unconscious that everyone inherits. No one is born with the idea of Odin in their head. But they do have part of their mental space sequestered off for the idea of Senex, the generic wise old man, and this idea is given form through characters such as Odin, Baal, and Thoth, who are all grouped together in the game's organization. To capture a shadow, Joker must find some point of commonality with it. That is, he must recognize it as being part of himself. Similarly, confronting and recognizing one's own shadows is a distinctive aspect of Jung's process of individuation. Once he's moved it from the dark parts of his psyche into the light of consciousness, Joker can then equip the shadow as a persona. But there's another gameplay use for personas that better exemplifies the Jungian concept. As Joker converses with important people called confidants, his bond with them strengthens. Each of these has a particular archetype that most closely exemplifies their personality. By equipping a persona belonging to the same archetype before conversing with a confidant, Joker forges his friendship with them faster since they're recognizing something of themselves in him. This is reflective of Jung's idea that we wear different personas for different people, choosing to share one side of ourselves with friends, another with family, and another with coworkers. Even more Jungian is the Phantom Thieves' entire modus operandi. They enter into their Mark's psyche and steal whatever it is the individual treasures so much that it's twisted their desires and distorted their perception of reality, and always end up confronting the target's shadow. After this treasure is stolen and the shadow defeated, the individual undergoes a dramatic change of personality. This can be seen as akin to psychotherapy. Despite stylizing themselves as thieves, their goal is to affect psychological and moral improvement in the subject, albeit less talking on a couch to defeat inner demons and more slashing them with samurai swords. Given all this, the consonance between the world building, story, and the gameplay mechanics all around this one unifying motif, and we've absolutely got to give Persona's use of Jungian psychology a certified deep. Part 2, Esoteric Tarot. The game continues its Jungian motifs with the use of tarot to organize elements such as shadows, personas, and confidants according to the archetypes found in the cards. Jung himself acknowledged the tarot as containing compelling archetypal imagery. He wrote, It also seems as if the set of pictures in the tarot cards were distantly descended from the archetypes of transformation. Tarot began back in the 15th century as a deck for playing card games. In addition to the traditional four suits, aka the minor arcana, it included 22 trump cards, the major arcana. Arcana. It wasn't until the late 18th century that it began to be used for occult purposes, of which you're probably most familiar with cartomancy, or divining the future by drawing cards. But apart from fortune-telling, the tarot was also incorporated into occult schools of thought, with each card taking on multitudes of meaning, such as the major arcana corresponding to one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and 22 paths of the Kabbalah's Tree of Life, or the four suits of the minor arcana corresponding to the four classical elements and the four letters of the Tetragrammaton. The use of the tarot as a set of symbols became known as esoteric tarot to distinguish it from its primary purpose as playing cards. The Order of the Major Arcana also tells a story, known as the Fool's Journey, that is seen as both the story of each individual soul and the history of the universe as a whole. Persona 5's most successful application of esoteric tarot is in structuring its confidant system around the Fool's Journey. Joker's own journey begins when he meets Igor, the confidant associated with Arcana Zero, Lamat, aka the Fool. In Esoteric Tarot, the Fool is at the first step on a path towards self-realization, with that path taking him through the subsequent cards of the Major Arcana. This is reflected in Joker's need to maximize his rank with all of his confidants, each of whom is explicitly linked to one of the Major Arcana, and whose own side story teaches Joker the lessons of their associated card. It's not enough for him to simply beat the final boss. Like the Fool, he has to achieve enlightenment in the way prescribed by Esoteric Tarot in order to unlock the game's true ending. Which arcana the confidants belong to often reflects the role they play in the narrative. Occasionally, the game makes a particularly appropriate connection regarding what arcana a character belongs to and which persona they manifest. Makoto's arcana is La Papesse, traditionally associated with the legendary Pope Joan, the very same as Makoto's initial persona, Joanna. But more often, the game makes a surface-level association between a character's arcana and their personality. An's arcana is Le Amaru, 
the lovers, primarily because she is the first love interest available in the game and the object of desire to multiple male characters. Futaba of Le Ermite literally hermits herself away in her room. Chahaya of the Rue de Fortune is herself a tarot reading fortune teller, and Te Takemi's work in the medical field places her in proximity to death hers being the card with no name, aka La Morte. This last one reveals how Atlas's understanding of esoteric tarot can be a bit shallow, as the 13th Arcana is associated not with literal death, but is rather symbolic of endings and change. In some cases, the surface level connections come at the cost of a deeper one. Haru's final persona, Astarte of the Empress Arcana, is specifically called the Queen of Heaven in the Bible. This naturally compares her with Mary, whom the Catholics affirm as the Regina Celi, the Queen of Heaven. However, Arthur Edward Waite, who co-created the most famous esoteric tarot deck, contrasts the Empress with Mary as Queen of Heaven, saying the Empress is associated with Mary only as Refugium Peccatorum, the refuge of sinners and an earthly Garden of Eden. According to him, the Empress is very specifically not a heavenly figure. The game gets it backwards. This is hardly nitpicking. Esoteric tarot is interesting specifically because its imagery and structure invite systemization with diverse schools of thought like the Jewish Kabbalah and the Catholic Corpus Doctrine. In getting the meanings mixed up, Persona 5 doesn't quite justify structuring its systems around the tarot. The game is obviously interested in tarot for its esoteric associations as well as its Jungian ones, but fails to engage with the esotericism in any real meaningful ways. The fact that the game follows the tarot of Marseille, an older deck more associated with card games rather than the Rider Waite deck which was specifically constructed to convey esoteric symbolism, certainly evidences this. While the fool's journey of the confidant system and one or two of the characters associated arcana are somewhat deep, for the most part, Persona 5's use of tarot is kinda dumb. Part 3. Ethical Systems and Moral Realism But Persona 5 is also structured to make a moral argument. The story is built around heisting a few major palaces, parts of the metaverse that have been warped by the distorted perception of a sinful individual. Because the Phantom Thieves suck at sneaking, all of their heists culminate in a climactic boss battle against the palace's owner, or at least their shadow. These big bads are based on the seven deadly sins, with each one of the palaces explicitly named after one of the vices. Number one, Kamoshida, like many dudes who coach high school girls athletics, is pervy. His palace is the Castle of Lust. Inside it, his shadow looks like Asmodeus, who, according to theologian Peter Binsfield, is the Prince of Hell associated with lust. 2. Matarame is an artist that uses other people's works to promote his own fame, so his palace is the Museum of Vanity. 3. Kaneshiro is a corpulent crime boss who hungers for more and more money from those he extorts. That may sound like greed, but his palace is the Bank of Gluttony, a theme reinforced not only by his rotundity, but by the Beelzebub-like appearance of his shadow, that being the demon Binsfield connected to Gluttony. 4. Futaba's anger at herself for apparently causing her mother's death results in her palace being the Pyramid of Wrath. 5. Okumura is a businessman who envisions his employees as robots existing only to labor for him, his palace being the spaceship of greed. He isn't interested in money solely, but wealth in all its various expressions, i.e. Mamon. So it's appropriate that the same demon is also the name of his shadow, again following Binsfield's list. 6. Nijima is a prosecutor who's so envious of her colleagues' win records that she's willing to do anything to get a conviction. Her palace is the Casino of Envy, where the house always wins, and her shadow, per Binsfield, is Leviathan. 7. Shido is a politician who, when he tried to force himself on a woman and Joker saved her, had Joker charged with assault. His express aim as Prime Minister is to screw over the unwashed masses while profiting his chosen few. You know, a typical politician. His palace is the Cruiser of Pride, traditionally the deadliest sin. 8. Humanity as a whole is responsible for such intellectual and moral laziness that they collectively have a distorted perception of reality, leading to the public palace known as Mementos, aka the Prison of Sloth. And no, we didn't forget how to count. The seven deadly sins have as their antecedent the monk Evagrius Ponticus's eight evil thoughts until Pope Gregory I subsumed vainglory under pride. The ordering of the villain's appearances conforms roughly to the severity of the sins per traditional Catholic understanding. This is seen most vividly in Dante's Purgatorio. Dante's ordering was lust, gluttony, avarice, sloth, wrath, envy, pride. This is essentially the same as the order of the palaces in Persona, with one important difference. Persona moves sloth to the final slot, suggesting that sloth is properly the deadliest sin. 
In addition to the inherent evil of their signature sin, the villains are also ordered with respect to their sphere of influence, with greater influence allowing for a greater severity to their transgressions. Whereas Kamoshida's influence is limited only to Shujin Academy, Madarame has influence over the entire art community, Kaneshiro over a wide swath of the criminal underworld, and Okamura and Shido on a national stage as captains of business and politics, respectively. The final boss is Yaldabaoth, a Gnostic name for the creator of the world because it wouldn't be a proper JRPG if you didn't kill God at the end. And being God, his influence extends over the whole of humanity. The name Yaldabaoth comes from the Apocryphon of John. Now the Archon, who is weak, has three names. The first is Yaldabaoth, the second is Saklos, and the third is Samael. This connects Yaldabaoth with the penultimate boss Shido, whose shadow is Samael, and Joker himself, as Saklos means fool, a reference back to Joker being on the fool's journey. Now, the narrative progresses in one other interesting way. The villains are ordered roughly according to which system of ethics their supposed authority derives from. Kamoshida and Madarame are both adults in positions of authority preying on high schoolers, Kamoshida by hitting on literal jailbait, and Madarame by stealing his students' artwork. Neither's actions align with any ethical theory, both simply presume that age gives them natural authority. This is pretty much the first ethical framework any individual operates under, to listen to those older than us. Kaneshiro's self-loathing at his own perceived weakness leads him to operate under the theory that might makes right, and to build a criminal enterprise to compensate. All of these are what psychologist Lawrence Kohlberg in his stages of moral development categorized as pre-conventional. Such moral attitudes are marked by their deference to superior power or prestige, as opposed to principled moral reasoning. Alternatively, as a prosecutor, Sai Nijima occupies Kohlberg's fourth stage of moral development, a conventional category in which the law itself is the foundation for morality, whether or not the law is actually just. Shido and Yaldabaoth represent Kohlberg's post-conventional stages of moral development. As Prime Minister, Shido's authority derives from the consent of the governed. This is Kohlberg's fifth stage, in which laws are malleable based on the will of the masses. Kohlberg's sixth stage is that of universal ethical principles. Right and wrong are the same for all people at all places at all times, regardless of man-made laws. One permutation of a universal ethical principle is divine command theory, the idea that the foundation of morality is whatever God says is right or wrong. As a stand-in for God, Yaldabaoth is representative of this type of moral reasoning. In fighting all these foes, the Phantom Thieves are not merely opposing the deadly sins themselves, but also the various ethical frameworks to which society has subscribed. And we think this is why the structure of the game imputes sloth as the deadliest sin of all. Humanity's sloth has made it intellectually and morally lazy. Humanity has abdicated the hard work of moral decision-making to these various ethical systems, and the even harder work of actually being morally active members of society to those few individuals running the various spheres of influence, and unfortunately, they've not been particularly moral. The thieves, while far from being immoral or amoral, don't neatly conform their ethical hand-wringing to any prescribed ethical theories. This is what differentiates them from the slothfulness of the masses under the sway of Yaldabaoth. Throughout all the heists cumulatively, the thieves go through an ethical process that French philosopher Jacques Derrida described as undecidability. Essentially, all moral decisions come down to deciding between taking actions based on a moral framework or rejecting those actions for any reason, ranging from not feeling like it to distrust for the moral frameworks at play. For instance, the thieves consistently reject the justifications for laws that Sai Nijima blindly enforces, and even when the rules seem to have a foundation, such as Shido's democratic mandate or Yaldabaoth's divine commands, such rote formulae won't necessarily apply to individual circumstances. Thus, according to Derrida, all moral decision-making is undecidable by prescribed ways of thinking. A decision that did not go through the ordeal of the undecidable would not be a free decision. It would only be the programmable application or unfolding of a calculable process. Only by exerting great moral and intellectual effort, by continually undergoing Derridean undecidability time and again throughout their careers, are our heroes able to avoid the deadly sin of sloth. 
but while the Phantom Thieves avoided slothfulness themselves, by being the only ones to take on these various systems, they become a moral crutch who everyone else outsources their decision making to. So whether it's the Thieves, or Sai, or Shido, the end result is the same. This is why Yaldabaoth remains as powerful as ever even after Shido is defeated. At first, this seems to be an example of the game's mechanics coming into conflict with its narrative. The story is saying that society itself has to overcome its moral lethargy, but by virtue of being a game that can only come about by decisions you as the player make, the NPCs never make a real choice and continue to avoid confronting undecidability and continue being slothful. Hiding the true ending behind maxing out all the confidants is a smart solution to this problem. That is to say that in the true ending, all the NPCs who help with the final victory have gone through the same ethical challenge as the Phantom Thieves. Despite challenging such ethical frameworks, by framing the decision to destroy Yaldabaoth as unambiguously right, Persona 5 ultimately affirms moral realism. Even if no one ethical system can fully articulate what makes good right and evil wrong, good and evil are very much real. It condemns the moral nihilism of the game's foil, Goro Akechi. This is a departure from Derrida who rejects the notion that we're ever approaching a true ethics and claims undecidability is the whole of the matter. But the game says it's only a step toward the truth of right and wrong. Thankfully, the game is much more clear than real life in assuring that you did the right thing, mainly by rewarding you with an anime waifu on Valentine's Day. So, for balancing the complication of ethical systems with an affirmation of moral realism and giving as extensive an examination of moral wrongdoing as Dante, Persona 5 is as deep as the ninth circle of hell. But tell us what you think, Wisecrack. Are we being too much like fortune tellers, reading too much into what's just not there? Or did we successfully infiltrate your cognition and force a change of heart as to how you feel about Persona 5? Let us know in the comments below. Big shout out to all our awesome patrons. Don't forget to subscribe. And before you go, I wanna give one last shout out to Dragon City. Once you have a collection of dragons, you can take them to battle and collect gold and EXP. Here you can see me using food to level up my movie fanatic dragon. And after some training, you should definitely be able to win some battles. The game also offers different PVP modes where you can take your favorite dragons and fight in the leagues or in the arena. There are new events every week like match three, puzzles, and mazes. So start growing your dragon collection and go to battle today. Hit the link in the description to download the game for free. And as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace.